Uh, thank you and welcome uh, to this webinar from the US Asia Law Institute from New York University School of Law. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce Professor Tim Webster of Western New England School of Law, who will be talking to us shortly about the what what I like to refer to as war and memory. Tim is a, an associate professor of law at Western New England University. He writes about comparative law and international law. He combines knowledge of China and Japan, and he has written specifically about the question of reparations and, as I mentioned before, war, memory, and for Tim's talk, you could add law. And so he is discussed, he discusses the role of law in dealing with memories. I'm not sure that's the way that Tim would put it, but that's the way I like to think of it. Uh, Tim has a long history of writing about this topic and other topics. He has uh, taught at Case Western University School of Law before going to Western New England. He has talked at a very wide range of places and done research, been a visiting fellow at a large number of places from Paris to Taiwan to Yale, which is in New Haven. And a, bef before that, he practiced international litigation in the Tokyo and New York offices of Morrison Forrester. So with that, I turn it over to Tim. Uh, he and I will then have a discussion, and then we'll have Q&A uh, starting at one o'clock. Tim? Excellent. Uh, well, Frank, thank you for that wonderful introduction. And I'd like to thank um, both Frank uh, and Alexis, and of course, my former colleague at Yale, Catherine Wilhelm, for extending me the invitation to speak today. Um, Frank is, in many ways, the perfect uh, discussant or um, interlocutor for this presentation I'm about to make, um, because it uh, deals with China, it deals with Japan, it deals with Taiwan, um, and it's actually perhaps more sociological than, uh, than legal. And as many of you know, Frank's book on law and social change in Japan is still widely cited. Uh, I'm still citing it in my work, uh, and it's still, I think, a really important um, set of insights into the way that law has been used and litigation has been used in particular to advance social causes in Japan. And perhaps, and, and we'll we can make a, a conclusion at the end of this talk, whether that particular technology has also spread to South Korea and to China. Um, but let me begin um, by sharing my screen with you. <coughs> um, okay, so um, what I'm going to do today is very briefly outline the current status of war reparations globally, uh, and then I'm going to drill down and look at what's been going on in East Asia for the past uh, 30 years. Um, I'm going to spend the first part of my talk talking about a Taiwanese soldier, a guy named Deng Sheng. You can see his name up there on the board. Um, and then if I have time, I will talk about another uh, Chinese soldier, a guy named Gong Jun. Um, and both of these men, I think, have played a really important, indeed seminal role in the war reparations movement in East Asia. And then at the end, I'll offer a few tentative conclusions. And then, of course, I'm uh, very much looking forward to a conversation with Frank about what all of this means. Um, so let me begin just by uh, very, very briefly and very, very superficially describing what has taken place in the West over the past 20 years with regards to war reparations. And I say this um, in part because as a comparative lawyer in the United States, you need to say how it relates to the United States no matter what you're talking about. Um, but also because I want to point to the significant amount of diplomatic attention our government has uh, used to resolve some of these matters that deal not with the Asian theater of World War II, but with the European theater of World War II. And as you can see on the slide, um, there have been a number of mechanisms and laws put in place in Germany, in France, uh, in Switzerland, and in the United States to address various aspects of World War II. So there was a, a forced labor uh, compensation fund set up in Germany after litigation was first filed in this country, in the United States, and um, with pressure from the US government, the German uh, corporate sector and government sector created a, an enormous $5 billion uh, remembrance fund that then dispersed small amounts of money to people who performed forced labor or slave labor 
during the war, uh, and that's a, a 2000 initiative. And over the next, you know, 2000, 2007, as I said, about one over a million people were compensated through this mechanism. Um, in France, as we speak right now, there is a tribunal that seeks to restore the value of property that was taken from Jews during the Vichy regime. Uh, and they won't give the property back, but if you can show uh, receipts or documentation or other kinds of proof that you had a property, you had a business, you had a home, what was it? Uh, that was taken during this period from uh, in the early 1940s, um, you could go to this claims tribunal and seek to have uh, comp seek to have financial compensation for that. And again, that is an effort that the U U.S. Um, uh, put a lot of pressure on France to restore. Uh, similar thing happened in Switzerland. Uh, similar thing happened with regards to people who were deported uh, from France to Nazi death camps in Eastern Europe. Um, that's been going on for the past uh, roughly four years called the Holocaust Deportation Claims Program. Um, so these are some of the, the, the current uh, or recent mechanisms that we've put in place in this country alongside our European allies to address some of these uh, war reparations causes, you know, 50, 60 years after the fact, seven years after the fact. Now, um, if we go to East Asia, and here I'm, I'm making no pretense of being comprehensive, I'm just giving you a taste of, of uh, headlines you've probably seen in the past couple of years anyway. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with the fact that two years ago in October 2018, the Supreme Court of South Korea ordered two Japanese multinational corporations, Mitsubishi and Nippon Steel Sumitomo, to offer compensation to forced laborers uh, taken from Korea and forced to work in Japan during World War II. People who were unpaid, people who were generally uh, went there against their will. And uh, after bringing litigation in Japan that they lost, refiled their cases in Korea, lost at the trial level, lost at the appellate level, and then in what I consider and many consider to be a fairly revolutionary decision, the Supreme Court of South Korea overturned that and said, no, you have to pay reparations to these Korean citizens. Uh, now, I'm sure many of you are aware that this decision has had tremendous diplomatic fallout between South Korea and Japan. Uh, people say that the two countries' relations are at their lowest point since the reestablishment of diplomacy in 1965. Um, and uh, even now, as we speak, um, Korea and the courts of Korea are seizing assets that belong to these companies and trying to figure out how they're going to pay these judgments, right? So they've taken over patents, they've taken over trademarks, they've taken over financial assets in an attempt to enforce the, the financing of this judgment um, from these Japanese corporations and the assets that they own in South Korea. Um, another example involved a 2016 settlement agreement worked out between another a subsidiary of Mitsubishi, the Mitsubishi Materials Company, um, and potentially hundreds of forced laborers in China. Again, this was in response to a lawsuit that was filed in China and uh, a lawsuit that Chinese courts actually accepted. Um, and the result of this was, uh, as you can see, um, uh, this is a, a Japanese executive from Mitsubishi making an apology at a hotel in Beijing. Um, and I'm being somewhat cynical when I say this, but Mitsubishi really used it as an opportunity to market the Mitsubishi name and the Mitsubishi brand and to try to claw back um, some of its reputation after it had been uh, sullied in all of these lawsuits and the various media that had reported on it. Um, uh, and it included uh, both an apology, which is uh, something of a rarity in these cases, um, and uh, payments, as well as uh, medical care and other, um, other social services for the forced laborers themselves. Okay, so this gives you some uh, inkling of what's been going on, both in this country and in Europe, and in Asia to repair harm done during the war. Um, in, in some of my other work that I will not rehearse here, I've tried to um, describe and analyze some of the lawsuits. Uh, there have been uh, over 80 cases brought in Japan from the 1990s to the present, as well as cases brought in South Korea, in China, in the United States, and the Philippines. Um, and so I think myself and, and many other scholars have looked at this, have sort of taken 
1990, 1991 as the starting point for this war reparations movement. And I, we can talk about why that's the case in Q&A. Um, but what I wanna do in this talk is to sort of push that horizon back five, 10, 15 years. Because what I found in some of my more recent research is that actually this idea of transnational war reparations uh, had been going on since uh, the 1970s, right, in East Asia, and uh, for reasons we can perhaps discuss, didn't get the attention of scholars and certainly this scholar. Um, uh, and so I'm hoping to uh, address that, maybe redress that by focusing attention on uh, first Taiwan, and then uh, if I have time, I'll try to talk about what happened in China as well. Um, now, let me just flag a couple of the assumptions that underline this paper uh, or this work. Um, and again, this is uh, directly from Frank Upham, um, whose work I, I earlier mentioned. Um, and I think it's helpful for us to understand litigation not simply as a private dispute between two parties, um, but as a way of addressing social change and as a way of uh, targeting uh, areas of the law or areas of social policy that haven't received the attention that some deserve. Uh, and Frank's work from 35 years ago uh, still stands. Um, Frank spent a lot of time looking at things like environmental pollution, uh, women's rights, others like Dan Foote have looked at labor law. Um, and I think there's a consensus, at least among many Japan law scholars, that litigation is not just about a private dispute, but it's also a way of addressing larger uh, social issues, such as war reparations, such as environmental pollution. Uh, and so I wanna make sure that we understand that as we understand this, this litigation and this, what I call socio-legal movement. Um, it's not just about, uh, you know, forced labor A against uh, Mitsubishi company. There's a broader discussion about uh, to what extent Japan should pay reparations uh, that I think all of these lawsuits, whether they're from Chinese or Korean or from Taiwanese people, um, helps us understand, okay? Um, it's also important because um, when uh, Western scholars look at Japan or look at China, I think they're often maybe blinded to some, uh, some forms of social activism because they don't neatly fit within what we Westerners, what we Americans expect to see in a social movement, right? So we want a demonstration or we want a protest or we want a vigil or uh, we want a letter writing campaign. Um, and a lot of the activism, you know, including litigation as I suggested here, um, you know, people are engaging in these issues but they're doing so in a different way. And that can be because the modalities of activism that we would expect uh, are not available, right? So China, for example, severely limits or curtails free speech. Uh, and so maybe you're not going to have, and, and freedom of assembly, freedom of uh, association. Uh, and so maybe you can't have a huge protest to get your point across. And so what I've tried to do in, in some of my other research is to look at letters, actually, that people have written um, and seeing, okay, even if they're not taken to the streets, they're still moving the cause forward by writing letters, uh, addressing uh, addressing the harm, uh, airing their grievances. Um, and so I want to make sure that we're looking at um, social activism not through our own lens, but in ways that may resonate more locally with uh, Japanese customs or Chinese customs or things like that. So um, I, th I think I'll, I'll hold off uh, on the rest of uh, this slide and instead move to Taiwan. And as I said before, uh, the, one of the arguments I'm making here is that we can actually trace this war reparations movement uh, back until at least the mid to late 1970s. And the way that uh, sociologists would frame this would be to say, okay, first of all, um, what is the political opportunity that allowed this particular issue to emerge? Uh, and so here, um, there's different sort of levels of generality that you can point to. First, I think we can talk about the international level. What, what is Taiwan going through as an international player? Uh, and then second, what's going on in Taiwan domestically, right, that allows for war reparations activists and, uh, as the case may be, Taiwanese veterans to step forward and demand compensation or demand access to resources that uh, Japanese nationals, right, uh, Japanese soldiers who have Japanese nationality were able to get. Okay, so um, first item here would be, as you can see on the screen, the derecognition of Taiwan. Okay, so this obviously puts Taiwan in a bit of a tailspin. Uh, they're ousted from the United Nations, countries like Japan, countries like the United States, steadfast allies, 
desert them. Um, and so that, that creates some amount of soul searching among uh, Taiwanese citizens and certainly the Taiwanese government. Um, but more specifically, it also addresses this um, provision of the Treaty of Taipei. And the Treaty of Taipei was the post-war agreement worked out between the Republic of China on Taiwan and Japan to resolve uh, the lingering issues of the war. And one of those provisions says that reparations will be taken care of by special measures. During the 50s and during the 60s, uh, the Taiwanese and Japanese governments have a few discussions, uh, but they're never quite able to figure out exactly what compensation or reparation to offer to the people of Taiwan. Uh, and now uh, in, the, in the 1972 derecognition, the Japanese government states further that this switch, right, from recognizing Taiwan to now recognizing the PRC means that the treaty itself is invalid, right? So this sort of casts a new or um, uh, allows people an opportunity to revise or rethink what kinds of um, means or what kinds of, of uh, reparative mechanisms had been put in place in the first place, right? And so this leads some people to say, well, actually, Japan, you haven't provided any reparations to us whatsoever. Uh, and now we're, we're made aware of it because uh, you have uh, derecognized our, our, uh, our country and also invalidated, nullified this treaty that we had signed with you. So that, that's one important event on the international sphere. Um, the second one that I think is, is just as important and perhaps less well known involves uh, the discovery of a Japanese, in quotation marks, soldier um, in Indonesia, right? So in, at the end of 1974, uh, Indonesian villagers come across this, again, Japanese in quotation marks, uh, soldier who had been, you know, living in the wilds of, uh, of, uh, of Southeast Asia for almost 30 years, right? He was a soldier, he uh, deserted, and basically uh, secluded himself from the rest of society, lived by himself for almost three decades. And so at the end of 1974, he's discovered uh, he says, I am a Japanese soldier, um, and so he's supposed to go back to Japan. Japanese, of course, figure out that he's really from Taiwan. Uh, he's indeed an ethnic Ami, right, one of the indigenous uh, peoples of Taiwan. Um, and so he's sent back instead to Taiwan, and the Japanese government essentially gives him a pittance um, for, uh, for compensation. They give him essentially a few hundred dollars and say, okay, now you're back. Uh, in Taiwan, uh, and we have compensated you. So um, people look at that, and again, uh, certain Taiwanese vets say, well, he's getting something, right? He's only getting a couple hundred bucks, but he's getting more than I am, right? Which is zero. Um, but more importantly, he is actually treated very differently from similarly situated Japanese soldiers, right? Because uh, in the 1950s, Japan passes a number of laws that provide pensions, that provide medical benefits, that provide allowances to soldiers who served in the Japanese Imperial Army. Um, but those laws both mandate Japanese citizenship. You have to be a Japanese national in order to take advantage of these various benefits, right? So if you're Taiwanese or if you're Korean um, or uh, you know, you're an indigenous Taiwanese person, um, these are not for you, okay? So this is another sort of international event that causes people to focus attention on this issue of war reparations. Um, now, domestically in Taiwan, uh, you have uh, Jiang Jingguo, the son of Chiang Kai-shek, taking power. And while uh, he is either rightly or wrongly credited with democratizing Taiwan in the late 1980s, um, there are already signs of some degree of liberalization, uh, less censorship, uh, more opportunity to register civil society organizations in the mid-1970s that suggests that uh, part of this movement may also have uh, domestic roots, meaning there, is, there are changes within Taiwan itself that allow people uh, to travel to Japan, uh, to meet with Japanese activists, to file lawsuits in Japan that they might not have had uh, before Jiang Jingguo uh, liberalizes Taiwanese society, even if it's still a, a relatively small amount. Um, and uh, in response to that, you have uh, Taiwanese citizens uh, going to Japan and filing, uh, as far as I can find, six different lawsuits that relate to different aspects of the war. Um, many of them, most of them, 
are about uh, financial instruments. So people who bought wartime bonds, people who got military scrip, uh, people who had a postal savings account from the Japanese post office now try to uh, argue in court that they want to redeem these bonds and the scrip. Um, and for the most part, Japanese courts turn them away and say, sorry, you had an opportunity to do that. Uh, that was in the 1960s, it's now 1977. And so your claims are essentially time barred. Okay, so most of these cases follow that, um, uh, that outline, right? Where they're, they're dismissed as being untimely. Um, uh, but in response to uh, the, the discovery of that Japanese soldier, right? Nakamura Teruo is his Japanese name or Li Guanghui is his Chinese name. Uh, in response to that, you have um, these civil society groups form in Japan. Uh, so in, in 1975, um, you have uh, two committees. Um, and when I say committee, I, I really mean grassroots organization, but you can see that there are names in, in Japanese uh, and they are sort of self-styled self committees or groups. And um, for, for ease of reference, I call one the request committee. You can see how long they're their Japanese name is, so that would take me all day just to say. Um, and there's also uh, what I'm calling the Consideration Committee, uh, or the Kangai Dukai, again, a much longer name that I'm just reducing to, to two words. Um, and, and these are both important because uh, they are, I'll, I'll, let me first describe the first one. The Request Committee is made up primarily of ethnic Taiwanese living in Japan, right? So after the war, you still have uh, thousands, if not tens of thousands of, of Taiwanese living in Japan doctors, lawyers, professors, translators, and so forth. Um, and they, uh, this, this existing group called the Zainichi Taiwanji and Dokyokai, um, the Resident Taiwan Association, essentially, they decide that this is an issue that matters to them and they want to take up this cause, right? First with Nakamura and then for, for Taiwanese vets in general. So that's one group. Um, a second group is actually comprised uh, primarily of ethnic Japanese, uh, Japanese intellectuals, a couple of professors from Meiji University are at the core of it. Um, and these are people who are uh, sinologists, China experts, or uh, they are people who actually grew up in Taiwan as kids, right? So Taiwan was a colony of Japan from 1895 to 1945. And so you have an, uh, you know, a lot of people in, uh, in who have since moved back to Japan, but who grew up in Taiwan and still maintain those affiliations uh, with Taiwanese people and with others, other Japanese who grew up in, uh, in Taiwan and now live back in Japan. Uh, and so they too are interested in resolving this particular issue. Um, and uh, the other important thing about this consideration committee for, for my purposes is that they produced a newsletter uh, every, maybe every six months, every eight months, they would issue another informal uh, you know, seven, eight, nine page newsletter that describes the lawsuit that I'll talk about, that describes the plaintiffs, that describes the activities, that describes the small, small scale protests they engage in, um, and also provide some comparative research as well. You know, how have the French dealt with their post-colonial soldiers? How did the Brits deal with their post-colonial soldiers? How did the Americans deal with their post-colonial soldiers? So this is a, a source of information um, that I have used, and I think also helps, helps us understand what was going on in Japan at that time. Okay, so um, after the formation of these two groups, they decide that they want to sue, right? They want to sue the Japanese government on behalf of uh, these Taiwanese soldiers who have been cut out from the same uh, reparative mechanisms or the same pensions and the same uh, allowances that Japanese soldiers get, but Taiwanese, Taiwanese soldiers do not get. Um, and so at this time, there's still a, a relatively small group of people who would be considered human rights lawyers, and I'll, I'll talk about them in a little bit. So instead, they turn to the JCLU, right, the Japan Civil Liberties Union, and ask if the JCLU would be willing to pony up some lawyers for this particular lawsuit. And the JCLU says, they sort of think about it for a little while. Um, and then uh, after seeing that there is indeed a human rights element to this case, they decide to accept it. So the JCLU sends three lawyers, um, two of them are in their 20s, one of them is in their 30s, so they're sort of the fresh meat, I suppose. Um, and these men, uh, three men, now litigate this, this case on behalf of the Taiwanese soldiers, okay? And in and, and doing so, um, I, I just wanna uh, point um, some of the frames that they use or the, or the way they talk about this issue 
and why the JCLU would be interested in doing so. And, and this is from uh, a statement that the JCLU put out in, uh, in 1977. Um, and they said, it says the following, it says that the Taiwanese were forced to fight in the Southern Islands, that's basically Southeast Asia, um, and mainland China. Educated in the Kouminka or Huangmenghua system, uh, many learned to die as imperial subjects, uh, they fought as Japanese and they died as Japanese. Um, and I think that there's there's a lot to unpack here, but I'll say a, a couple of things. Um, one is this term kouminka, right? And this was the prevailing discourse that the Japanese used when colonizing Taiwan because they didn't want them just to be uh, Taiwanese. They wanted them to be, as you can see from the kanji there, imperial subjects, people who were loyal to Hirohito, people who were loyal to the Japanese emperor, and he, who were loyal to the Japanese imperial system, right? So the idea was, we'll educate you in Japanese, we'll educate, you know, you'll, you'll bow down to the emperor, you'll sing the national anthem, and we will create imperial subjects out of you, right? Even though you're Taiwanese, and even though, you know, Japanese is your second language, we think our education system can imperially subjectify you, or, or kominka. Uh, you okay, um, so that that's that's part of it, um, and the second part is this similarity uh, of calling them essentially Japanese, right? And, and why does that matter? That matters because you might not be able to see the the, the final piece of my slide. No, I'll, I'll I'll come back to this in a minute. Um, uh, that matters because um, ultimately, what they argue here um, in front of uh, Japanese trial courts is that these people are being discriminated against on the basis of their nationality, and that really we should be thinking of them just as Japanese, right? Because, you know, during the colonial period, they were, they were, sub, they were citizens of Japan, right? They were imperial subjects, but citizens nonetheless. Um, and so when we think about why Japan should provide the same benefits it provides to its own citizens, well, you're essentially just, these are just more Japanese people that we've cut off. Right, so that there's this idea that essentially they are even now in the 1970s Japanese and should be treated as Japanese. Now, um, just to draw the link between this movement in the 1970s, 1980s, and what happened in the 1990s and 2000s, I, I want to make sure that this this point is clear because again, it speaks to this socio legal phenomenon that I think is important. Um, in, in both of these instances, in both the, the Taiwanese vets case and in mo most of the litigation that unfolds in the 90s and 2000s, you have um, civil society groups um, who are supporting these plaintiffs. And when I say support, I mean they're uh, raising funds to pay for court costs, they are raising funds to bring people from Taiwan, people from China, people from South Korea over to Japan to litigate, to testify in court. Um, these same civil society groups often meet with the plaintiffs, have dinner with them, take them out to a show, show them around Japan and so forth. Uh, and so there is a, a social component to it as well. And again, I think you can, you can trace that, that social component all the way back to the 1970s and, and perhaps even before. Um, the other thing is the importance of lawyers and what we might call cause lawyers or human rights lawyers in particular. Um, here in this case, they had to go to the JCLU, but what we've seen um, over the course of the 1990s and the 2000s has been essentially an informal grouping of roughly 240, 250 lawyers in Japan who argue these cases on a pro bono basis, right? So at, th at this point, we have a, a collection of Japanese lawyers who will do this, right, an informal network. But before that, right, in the 1970s, before the war reparations movement sort of took off, they uh, instead looked to the, uh, to the JCLU, the, you know, the Japanese equivalent of the ACLU, for these lawyers. But again, the idea of lawyers and civil society groups coming together to litigate these cases is something that I hadn't, I think, focused sufficient attention on, and I think is an important part of the story here. Now, um, just to go back uh, a little bit to what soldiers themselves say, um, and again, there's, there's different quotes I could point to, but I think this one is, is helpful. Um, this is uh, what I'm calling, and it's, it's probably problematic, but I'll call it anyway, is some inkling of post-colonial nostalgia. And if you go to Taiwan, um, you will see that many, not all, but many people actually look to Japan and look to the Japanese colonial experience in, um, if positive might be too strong a word, 
but um, as a beneficial episode in the development of their own country, right? And, and if you then go to Korea and talk to Koreans about colonialism, you'll get a very different sense of what Japanese colonialism means. And so there is, I think, in, uh, in the air in Taiwan, this idea that, well, you know, colonialism wasn't so bad under Japan, you know, and we can talk about whether that's really the case, um, but at least strategically, um, and, and when soldiers are interviewed and when soldiers, again, Taiwanese soldiers talk about it, they use language like this, right? This is from somebody uh, who served in the Japanese Imperial Army. He says, I was shocked to see all the Japanese turn their backs on us, even though we had served as Japanese soldiers, had fought for the Japanese, were killed and disabled for the Japanese people and lent our money to the Japanese government in the form of military postal savings, right? So these are people who are saying, uh, we were Japanese, right? We were the same as or similar to uh, Japanese people and should be treated um, just the same way that soldiers of Japanese nationality are treated. And so this is one way that they're able to make, uh, when, they, when they come to court, a constitutional claim of the right to equality, they're being denied their equal treatment of law because of their citizenship, their Taiwanese as opposed to Japanese, right? So that there's also a strategic element to that as well. Um, now this is, uh, this is Deng Sheng. This is the, the named plaintiff in this case brought uh, by Taiwanese vets against the Japanese government. Um, and importantly, I think, he loses at all three levels. He loses at the trial court, he loses at the appellate court, and he loses at the Supreme Court as well. Um, uh, but let me just give you um, a, a, a quick translation I did from the, uh, from the Tokyo High Court, so the appellate court decision, says the following thing. So after they dismiss his claims, uh, and, and Japanese judges sometimes do this, and they've done it several times in the war operations context, is they have an addendum, a fugen, uh, basically kind of a personal aside um, or a personal note about how they feel or how they reacted to the case. And so I'll, I'll, I'll read this out to you. It says, um, it's clear that the plaintiffs, these Taiwanese vets, suffered significant disadvantages when compared with similarly situated Japanese people, right? So I've tried to make this argument that the Taiwanese are trying to portray themselves as, as Japanese. Uh, moreover, over 40 years have passed since they were injured in the war, we expect, meaning we the judges, uh, the three judge panel here, expect that government officials will devote efforts to overcome the expected diplomatic, financial, and legal hurdles, uh, wipe away this disadvantage as quickly as possible, and strengthen Japan's international credibility, right? So again, this is uh, one judge sort of saying, uh, you know, nothing we can do here, but we hope that the political branches, the executive branch or the legislative branch will take this up and actually resolve it because we as the court are unable or unwilling to do this, but we think it's a serious enough issue for the government itself to take up, okay? Um, I realize I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, closing in on the end of my time. Um, so let me just, uh, let me just finish up with, with the Taiwan and then uh, I'll have a discussion with Frank and I hope you guys will all join in after that. So um, even though the litigation itself does not succeed, right? I said that he lost at all three levels. What does happen um, is that the diet, the Japanese legislature actually passes a law in 1987 to provide compensation to people like Deng Xiaoping. Right, so they pass something called the Taiwanese or the Taiwan Veterans Act, which doesn't give the same amount of money, uh, but gives some money, uh, roughly $20,000, to people uh, who were injured in the war, uh, like Deng Sung, he lost the, the use of his right eye, um, and others who, were, uh, who served or who were injured in World War II while serving in the Japanese Imperial Army. Okay, now uh, why is that important? Because uh, the, the, you know, since that time, you know, in the 33 years since, um, Japan has not passed any other legislation to compensate war vets um, or uh, victims of the war. So comfort women or forced laborers or people like that. Uh, and so the, the point I, I'd like to make here is that by framing these veterans as uh, lapsed, uh, colonial subjects, right, as loyal Japanese soldiers, that actually goes quite a long way with the conservative ruling party, the Liberal Democratic Party, that's ruled Japan for the past 70 years, right? So, um, you know, there was initially, uh, you know, most LDP people 
uh, politicians would have said, no, this is, this is uh, ridiculous. But once they framed it as an issue of Japanese soldiers, once they framed it as an issue of imperial subjects, I think um, that goes a long way to convincing people in the Diet and, and LDP members in, in particular. And you can't pass a law in Japan without getting the LDP on board that these veterans are worth um, uh, compensating because of the sacrifices they made uh, on behalf of the country. Um, I think that's all I'll all I will say about that. Um, you know, we can talk about China. There's there's a lot to talk about. Um, there's this guy. Uh, another uh, soldier, uh, maybe we can talk about him in the Q&A. Um, but let me just wrap up and then, uh, Frank, I look forward to your, um, to your thoughts. So, um, you know, what does this all mean? In, in, in my prior work, I sort of conceived of this as a uh, of war reparations litigation as uh, maybe a single tree or a single trunk. I'm looking out, I can see all the beautiful trees in, in New England right now, um, with lots of different leaves and lots of different branches. And now I'm sort of rethinking that and thinking, well, maybe this is more like a rhizome, meaning it's a, it's a living organism, but it has lots of different roots and lots of different shoots that move out in different directions. So there's a Taiwanese set of roots, there's a Chinese set of roots, there's a Korean set of roots, there's a Japanese set of roots, and all of these have sort of tangled uh, into each other and created what I think we could now call the war reparations movement. Um, second thing, and again, this is sort of channeling Frank Upham circa 1986, um, litigation is obviously a way that the victims can have their day in court and seek redress, um, but it, it matters perhaps even more sociologically, right? It gives people an opportunity to air their grievance, gives people an opportunity to invite the media to come and cover it, to raise awareness, um, and also for the activists themselves. And, and don't forget, you know, we hear about comments made by Abe, we hear about comments made by members of the conservative Liberal Democratic Party. Um, and, and certainly I see that and think and sort of make the mistake that this is what people in Japan think. And that's what certain people in Japan think. But there's um, just as active and just as vibrant a uh, group of people who are promoting the cause of war reparations. And this is a way that they, by supporting themselves, by supporting these lawsuits and by joining these different committees I've told you about, can uh, put into practice their beliefs about Japan's role in the world and about Japan's role in World War II. Um, final thing I'll say, and then um, I, I look forward to having a discussion with Frank. Uh, I began by talking about a number of international agreements and mechanisms that the U.S. has put in place with Germany, with Switzerland, with France, and so forth. Um, and that's essentially not going to be duplicated here in Asia, right? Um, we've already seen that there's uh, various jurisdictions. We've seen already uh, the diversity of uh, remedies that have been worked out. So 1987 Taiwan Vets Law, um, the settlement agreement that Mitsubishi worked out with Chinese forced laborers, this unenforced judgment that the South Korean Supreme Court has handed down, um, as well as you know, a, a broad range of actors from activists and corporations to, uh, to judges and politicians. Um, and I, I'm just uh, predicting that this is the way things are going to be. We're not gonna have a nice, tightly uh, wound up resolution to this issue uh, or any of these issues, any of the bilateral issues between Japan and any of these countries. Um, similar to what we saw between the U.S. and France, or the U.S. and Germany, or the U.S. and, uh, and Switzerland. So uh, I'll stop there. Um, Frank, I look forward to comments and questions you have, and then uh, if, if the broader audience has comments and questions as well, I'd be delighted to hear them. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing. Okay. Uh, thank you, Tim. Uh, if I wasn't constrained by my institutional role, um, I would just say, just keep talking. Um, okay. <laughs> um, it's, it's, it's fascinating. And uh, for me, it, it strikes a lot of, a lot of my memories of Taiwan uh, and Japan, and very briefly, Korea. But I, I'd like to ask a couple of clarification questions first. And it may be that other people have the same um, uh, lack of fully understanding here. You talk about it at the very beginning, at the very end, about the US putting in place a series of laws in Germany and France. Uh, 
those are French and German laws, right? I mean, so what you say the U.S. put them in place. It was like the U.S. was the actor. Could you just explain a little bit what, what, what that was? Sure. Um, and also yeah. in there you had the SNS, SNCF. Is that the, the, the French uh, railroad? Exactly. Exactly. It's Société Nationale de Chemin de Fer. Um, uh, so uh, you're right. I was a little, a little hard and fast with the facts there. Um, so let me, let me clarify. The U.S. Um, during the Clinton administration had a, an official in the Treasury named Stuart Eisenstadt. And Stuart Eisenstadt actually went to Germany and negotiated a deal with the Germans that said uh, the Germans will set up a foundation or a fund that will then, and, and those monies will then be used, will be dispersed to uh, German, uh, actually not just German, uh, anybody who served, or who, who performed forced labor or slave labor in Germany during World War II. So again, there, there is a, I, I should have specified, there is an international agreement between the United States and Germany, but there is actually a German law passed afterwards that actually is in charge of dispersing the funds. Um, likewise, the US put pressure on the French government uh, and then the French government did not pass a law. They instead essentially passed an administrative regulation that set up this uh, Commission d'Indemnisation de Victimes de Spoliation, this, uh, the CIVS, which currently, even now, is handling these uh, property restitution issues. Um, likewise, uh, with the Swiss, and the Swiss were sort of the most grumpy about this, um, the US said, uh, and again, the, 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 the origin of all of these are lawsuits filed in New York um, under the Alien Tort Statute that says, oh, you know, we think actually you owe us, or in the case of the Swiss, we think you actually seized our bank accounts during the war and we'd like them back, thank you very much. And of course, the, the Swiss hemmed and hawed and said, oh, you know, secrecy prevents us from disposing everything. Uh, and then people like um, Al D'Amato, the then senator from New York, held hearings, mobilized public opinion, got the World Jewish Federation involved. Uh, and so after that, um, the, the ultimate resolution of that is the Zurich Claims Tribunal. Um, again, not something that passed through the Swiss legislature, but was, uh, I think, agreed to by the Swiss government at the time to uh, allow the, the, the money from these various spoliated bank accounts to be returned to the rightful owner or his or her heirs if the rightful owner has passed away. So you're right, it, it wasn't the US that passed a law, but the US did apply pressure and sometimes that was formulated in an international agreement to get these uh, European countries to focus on these um, uncompensated aspects or uncompensated war crimes that uh, again, 50 years later had still not been addressed. Uh, that explains it, thank you. Um, I have a, 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 this is not really a clarification, this is just a, a, a question that struck me. Um, I've had a similar experience, uh, having lived in Taiwan, uh, knowing some Japanese and speaking to uh, older Taiwanese, they weren't that old at the time, but um, in Japanese, and just having them light up and talk about their sensei, their, their, their teachers, and so on, what you describe as post-colonial post -colonial nostalgia, that might be politically incorrect, but I don't think it's inaccurate. Then I haven't spent much time at all in Korea, uh, going to Korea, and I uh, don't speak Korean, and I would encounter people whose English was not very good. And so they were older. And so I would start speaking in Japanese because I knew that they had gone to school in Japanese and uh, that we would be able to communicate uh, in Japanese. Their Japanese would be much better than mine. Uh, they would have preferred to do anything uh, rather than they prefer just not to communicate at all. Uh, rather than speak to me in Japanese. So my experience is very similar to yours. And uh, so I would say that the Korean attitude was post-colonial bitterness. And uh, I'm wondering if you could I, I'm, try to explain it. Try to the explain difference. the difference. Why Taiwan has one reaction and Korea has a different reaction? Yes. 
Okay. Um, given time constraints, I'll, I'll try to be as brief uh, as I can. Um, <clears throat> I think part of it has to do with Taiwan's unique position. I think, I think generally, well, uh, I think as someone who's read a lot of post-colonial theory, my expectation is that the, uh, the former colony doesn't like the former colonizer, right? I think that's kind of the default setting. And you know, there's some variation on that, right? I think in the United States, we're sort of over the UK colonial period from 250 years ago. Um, but if it were a more recent um, liberation from the UK, maybe we'd have a different attitude. So, um, I, so I think- in the early eight, So early 19th century, we preferred the French. Definitely. Definitely, right? We all saw Hamilton. Um, but I think with Taiwan, it's complicated by the fact that they are, you know, their mortal enemy is sending them, you know, right across the Taiwan Straits with missiles trained on Taipei. Uh, and so when you're reviewing your history, you have to say, okay, well, and this is, this is one of the narratives that I've seen in Taiwan, you know, the Chinese sold us out in 1895, right? Sure, they lost the Sino-Japanese War, but they didn't have to get rid of us. And so, you know, you know they, they got rid of us um, and they hadn't really developed the island very much until that time. And uh, again, I, I acknowledge this is the, the politically incorrect post-colonial nostalgia line I am here advocating for you, but you've asked for it, so I'm, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm giving it. Um, and they look at the Japanese uh, industrialization. They look at the fact that Japan put trains in place. They, fact, they talk about the fact that uh, Japan actually set up uh, Taiwan University. Um, hospitals, schools, uh, and all the infrastructure that actually Ch Qing Dynasty China had not put in, right? So they can point to concrete manifestations that still exist now and say, this is what Japan did for us. What did China ever do for us? That's, of course, uh, on top of the fact that since 1949 to the present, China and Japan, actually, uh, China and Taiwan have been, you know, mortal enemies. Um, you know, maybe there's a, a slight relaxation of that during Ma Ying-jeou. Um, but, you know, if, if your enemy is right there across the border, um, then you're going to, you might look somewhere else in a more friendly light. Uh, and so I, I think that, that explains part of it. Um, now, of course, the South Koreans are also, you know, across their border, right? You have North Korea. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, why is there such hatred towards Japan? Um, again, I think there's, you know, generally a sense that the, the colonial empire is bad. Um, but, you know, I think well, maybe over the past 20 or 25 years, there has been a, a deep um, revision of Korea's history, right? So, um, you know, just as with Japan, the people who, who, who the, the militarists who were leading Japan in the 40s basically became the LDP and ruled Japan, you know, in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. And a similar thing happened in Korea, right? The people who ruled Korea, quote unquote, post-colonial Korea, were themselves, uh, for the most part, high level officials or military officials in the Japanese colonial government. So there wasn't much of a breakage, there wasn't much of a, uh, a reconciliation or revision of that period, really until democratization in, in South Korea in the 1980s and 1990s. And, and during that period, there's been, up until the present, there's been a, um, a reviewing of that period. And as you can see, you know, I, I talked about this South Korean uh, Supreme Court case that I didn't talk about it in detail, but that case proceeds from the assumption that the entire annexation of Korea was itself illegal. They said, look, 1910 annexation is illegal uh, you know, under international law, although probably not under international law of 1910. Uh, and from that, uh, everything that Japan did to Korea is itself illegal, right? You have that um, you know, first seed being illegal and then anything that Japan did from mobilization to Japanese language education, everything is illegal. Uh, and so that, that's part of, and again, it's, it's obviously rooted in, in strong nationalism, um, but it's also rooted in a revisionist past that I think is ascendant in Korea, it has been ascendant for the past 30 years. Um, and, you know, Taiwan is sort of looking around for allies and they can point to Japan and say, well, it may have been bad in the colonial period, but there's still stuff even now that we can point to uh, with some amount of, uh, of nostalgia or some amount of good feeling. So. 
Um, probably not a satisfactory answer, but at least I've given you some of the uh, some of the dynamics to explain the difference uh, the difference between Koreans and Taiwanese when it comes to the colonial period. The the idea that the Japanese occupation or incorporation of of, of Korea was illegal was a a theme in the 2018 um, Japanese uh, Korean Supreme Court case that you mentioned and yes, yes. Uh, it, it, but this is getting much much too much into the into the weeds so I, I will pull out before we venture into the weeds where I, I know that you would be willing to go with me but uh, and ask a we'll more, go there in November okay all right ask a a, a 30,000 feet um, question sure. uh, and that is your, your your description of the effect of the litigation in Japan, of course, I sympathize with with your interpretation uh, greatly. Uh, I think litigation in Japan is uh, politically and socially and emotionally, I think emotionally is important, uh, very important. And I think that's one of the reasons litigate this type of litigation is brought. My question is whether you really think that that's more true in Japan than it is in the United States. You know, litigation has to do with emotion and and politics and social values in the United States too. Um, is it is there a qualitative difference? And if so, what would the difference be? Where would yeah, it come? So I think that's a good point. I think what, what I find, at least um, it, instantaneously, what I think is different, uh, and again, this could just be my ignorance of how American litigation works. What surprises me, uh, again, about, about war reparations litigation in particular, is that you will have these xienkai, right? These jiu and hui, these, these groups that form, you know, made up of common Japanese citizens, educators, restaurateurs, shopkeepers, uh, you know, not necessarily uh, you know, coastal elites, um, but <laughs> run-of-the-mill people who have been exposed to this and said, oh, you know what, maybe actually what Japan did in Korea or what Japan did in China was wrong. Uh, and so what, what I find fascinating is that um, you will have these groups of people form uh, to, to create this, what I call a trial support group or a shienkai. Um, and they will, as I said, gather uh, they will raise money, they will have uh, events amongst themselves, they will bring plaintiffs over, fund them, they will help raise money to, for court costs, uh, and then, and then you know, produce newsletters if they're particularly um, you know, active members of the group. We'll disseminate a newsletter to the hundreds uh, or so of, the, of uh, dues paying members. There's also membership fees, you know, usually three to 4,000 yen a, uh, a year. Um, and so that aspect, I think, is, and again, I could be wrong about how uh, litigation works in the U.S., but I, I'm not aware of the fact that in the U.S. we, we will have, uh, I mean, obviously you have cause lawyers in the United States. I'm not saying that, that that doesn't exist, but the fact that civil society groups are invested and, and want to support that and want to be part of the action, I think, is actually quite qualitatively different. Um, the other thing that's interesting is that once that group, you know, you know, goes to the trial court, it goes to the appellate court, it goes to the Supreme Court, and then after the Supreme Court renders its decision, these groups dissolve as if they never existed, right? Uh, and so again, people criticize Japan for having weak civil society. People say, you know, that Japanese civil society um, member are, are essentially, as Robert Peckinham would suggest, uh, members without advocates, right? So people who, who get together but don't really ever do anything, never really challenge social policy. Um, and I think actually these groups show the exact opposite, right? It shows that you can be involved in a grassroots organization that is literally dedicated to litigation um, and, and use that you know, for your own identity or use that to, 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 um, to raise funds. Um, and that becomes the form of civil society engagement that is, I don't wanna say it's widespread, but you know, each of these little groups and, and every, every single one of these lawsuits in Japan has its own shienkai or, or you know, most of them do, right? So that means that there's several hundred people in Fukuoka, there's you know, maybe several thousand people in Tokyo, there's several hundred people in Sapporo, there's several hundred people in Shimonoseki, 
uh, you know, all anywhere you have these lawsuits, these war reparations lawsuits, and, and they've, they've mushroomed up and down the archipelago, you will have a, a group of people who support them and who want to dedicate their time and dedicate their money to this particular cause. Uh, and the cause is actually litigation um, and not necessarily reparations itself. So I think, I think those are some of the important differences that I see between uh, litigation in Japan, at least this litigation in Japan, and uh, you know, similarly situated human rights litigation or cause litigation in the United States. Well, I wonder if Robert Pekinen ever lived in Japan, because uh, if he lived in Japan, at least in uh, an ordinary neighborhood, as opposed to, say, one where there were a lot of uh, foreign uh, residents, hmm. he would have encountered a fairly strong civil society, at least I have in the times that I have uh, uh, lived there. So right. remarkable to me when you mentioned people saying that uh, Japan didn't have a strong civil uh, of civil society, but uh, I a couple of other um, one of the things that may enable uh, these these cases to be vehicles for mobilization, social and political mobilization, is the structure of Japanese civil procedure. So a Japanese case will take uh, as long as an American case, uh, but it will have more open hearings. Mm -hmm. And each hearing is a, uh, is substantive. Uh, they aren't, they aren't um, uh, motions hearings about the number of interrogatories that each side could have, which is a hard uh, item to organize civil society around but they will be actual substantive uh, evidence uh, will be presented, but it'll be done over maybe once every two months or something. So right. you have constant uh, iterations of, of, of political ideas in the litigation. Mm -hmm. Another yeah. possibility is maybe your emphasis on the Xi'an Kai, that the Xi'an Kai may be more important to the lawyers, or maybe uh, a stronger mobilizing force for the Japanese lawyers who are involved than for similar cause lawyers in the US who may just go off and do it on their own uh, without um, uh, significant uh, social backup. But it is one o'clock and I wanna, I have plenty of other questions um, but, and I just resisted the temptation to ask one more of them, so, but I will continue to resist that temptation. Okay. So, let, me, let me just briefly respond to your okay. most yeah. recent provocation, um, which is just to fill out what you said about the litigation or the hearing itself. Um, the hearing itself actually serves as, in my opinion, a mobilizing event, right? So people, uh, you know, they'll have a procession leading up to the courthouse beforehand, well, they'll have a banner, and the plaintiffs, sometimes comfort women, sometimes nonagenarian forced laborers, are walking alongside the lawyers, walking up to the courthouse. If they're there early, they'll then camp out in front of the courthouse for photo ops. And of course, they'll, they'll notify all the major media to show up beforehand. Um, they will also take advantage of the hearing itself to fill as many of those seats in the gallery as they possibly can, right? So you will read in these newsletters that uh, they once again it literally packed the court, right? They, they got all 48 seats in courtroom 12. Uh, everyone was occupied by one of our activists, right? So again, this, this conveys to the judges that this is a serious matter that people in Japan care about. It's not just some random comfort woman from Korea. There are Japanese citizens sitting in the, in the, in the gallery who want a resolution of this case as well. Uh, and then afterwards, and depending on, on how, the, um, how the case goes, you will have people unfurl banners that say, you know, unjust verdict. Um, and again, they'll be standing out there outside the court with the court in the background for maximum photo opportunities. So you're absolutely right. I mean, the, the, the lawsuit itself and, this, and the way it works and the fact that you have maybe four, you know, 30 or 40 hearings over the course of a five year period, each of those presents itself as an opportunity for mobilization. But yeah, I'm in complete agreement with your observation. Yeah. Um, well, we have, uh a question, I will, I will uh, read it. Um, you mentioned reparations cases in national courts in China. 
the Philippines, Korea, Taiwan, and the U.S. Can you say more about the extent the complainants attempted to use international human rights law as a basis, such as a, quote, right to a remedy or even the right to truth? Um, this is me talking now. Um, I know nothing about international human rights, but uh, so if, if there is a right to to a remedy or a right to truth, international human rights law, I hope that you will expand a little bit about that. But going along with the question about whether such claims got any judicial traction, or is the use of international human rights more likely used in non-judicial efforts, such as the letter writing that you mm -hmm. mentioned? Um, well, great I guess, question. I, guess the internet, I, I shouldn't have interjected there, but I guess the main question is, what's the role of international human rights as a basis for a right to truth or a right to remedy? Um, the idea of a, I mean, the, the idea of a right to a remedy is something that I think you can find in a number of international human rights instruments, okay. ICPR, ICSER. So that I think is, is fairly uncontroversial. The idea of a internationally recognized right to truth, um, I'm not quite sure where you would turn to for that. Um, you know, there are, of course, truth and reconciliation commissions that have been that have spread it up all over the world, including in South Korea and Taiwan. Um, but I, I can't think of an instrument that guarantees the right to truth. I mean, I, I suppose there is, uh, you know, the right to information, um, you know, receiving and giving information. That's part of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So it's possible, I suppose, to um, to expand upon that. Um, when courts have actually dealt with these issues, and uh, m many cases in Japan have actually used different human rights treaties, not the ones that you, uh, I guess you wouldn't teach them, but not the ones that you would teach in a human rights course, but things like uh, the Slavery Convention, things like the Prostitution Convention, uh, things like the Geneva Protocol on using chemical weapons, and uh, at least, in, and you, you see this a lot in, in Japanese cases, um, very few of very few judges have actually dealt with these international law claims and they've dismissed them saying look uh, international law only can be applied between states right so if Korea were bringing a case against Japan then yes we might be willing to handle your case but individuals cannot bring cases against the states and so you can you can cite the uh, the Hague conventions uh, Hague regulations which are about humanitarian war but those various treaty, the slavery convention, the prostitution convention, none of those actually allows or gives an individual the right to seek compensation from a state. So these, these kinds of human rights claims have been litigated numerous times in Japan and Japanese courts with very, very few exceptions have said they don't apply because of the difference between the state and the individual. Um, in some of the other cases. So in the US, um, there were cases brought under the US, under the uh, Alien Tort Claims Act, including uh, on behalf of comfort women. Um, there, you do see customary international law saying prostitution is illegal, slavery is illegal, therefore the comfort women system is illegal. Um, but uh, at least in the US, those, those cases were dismissed, as were other cases that I mentioned brought by Europeans, again, using the Alien Tort Statute, because they're either time barred or because the treaties between the US and Germany or the treaties between the US and Japan had resolved or perhaps more clearly dissolved the individual right to compensation. Um, in the Korea case, just to, just to fill it out, the uh, international law plays almost no role. And I think it's actually a huge missed opportunity for the South Korean Supreme Court to ground its claim. What it does, it says, you know, Japanese law, Japanese annexation was illegal. So what we're gonna do is apply Korean law from 1948, re you know, retroactively. Uh, and as a lawyer and as an international lawyer, I, I obviously have some qualms with that because I think they could have said just as easily had they been more inclined to look at international law, the comfort women system clearly violates the slavery convention, clearly violates the prostitution convention. And even if uh, the prostitution convention doesn't apply to colonies, I think you can still make a pretty good customary international law claim that says you can't traffic underage women across national borders for purposes of sex, right? That would, I think, be a, even if we were to apply the law of the 1930s, the 1940s, you could make a fairly good customary international law claim. Instead, the Koreans have said, no, we're only going to apply our own law retroactively. 
And so they've essentially viewed this as a tort, right? Sort of a, a, a garden variety um, intentional tort. Um, and that's how, that was the, uh, the basis for finding liability against Mitsubishi and uh, Nippon Steel. Or, or uh, quantum merit. In other words, we work for you for five years, pay us our wages. Right. Uh, yeah, yeah. So um, we have a couple more questions. Great. Uh, do, do you think uh, uh, the Chinese government made a big mistake when it gave up official war reparations from Japan? <laughs> and if you could give some background on that, because I didn't know that that it did and whether that's the ROC or the PRC, I'd be interested. Yeah, Would, that, 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 that's the, well, the I, PRC. There's, 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 there's more to the question, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry, go ahead. I will stop interrupting myself. Uh, with war victims dying out, and frustration they faced with Japanese courts and the government, what would be the prospect of these individual claims? Um, okay. So I guess two questions. The first one, did the Chinese government make a big mistake? Yeah, um, uh, great question. I, I'm, I'm sorry I didn't get to talk about the China piece of this because that's a whole nother very fascinating chapter in this saga. Um, if you go back and look at the joint communique between China and Japan in 1972, it says that the Chinese government, and I'm, I'm going to mangle the language, the Chinese government has, uh, you know, for, for purposes of amity and international peace, the Chinese government has waived reparations from Japan. Something like that. I'm paraphrasing, but that, that's the, that's the, that's the, uh, the brunt of it. And um, so you could look at that and say, well, look, you know, the Chinese gave it up and they got nothing in return. And that's, I think that's true. Uh, and I think people like Zhou Enlai who were trying to negotiate this um, gave that up and, and didn't get much in return for it. Um, but people uh, have challenged the joint communique on a couple of different levels. So uh, one, they've said, yes, the PRC, the government gave up its right to seek compensation, but they said nothing about the individual right to seek compensation. So if you look at the San Francisco Peace Treaty of 1952, there it says the individual right to reparations as well. Right? It's clear that that's what was going on during the uh, San Francisco Peace Treaty negotiations of 1952. Um, and uh, people like uh, Jiang Zemin and uh, Qian Qi Chen, who was the foreign minister in the early 1990s, basically said what I just said. They said, yes, the government gave it up, but we didn't necessarily say that individuals no longer have the right to seek reparations from Japan. Now, talk is cheap, and China has actually done very little in its own system to uh, allow those claims to move forward. What, what, what the Chinese have done, for better or for worse, is to allow all these plaintiffs to go to Japan, right, and file cases in Japan. There have been a, a number of cases brought in China, but Chinese courts basically refuse to accept them. Uh, and, and when you go back and look at uh, some, some of these cases from the early, uh, from the mid 1990s, when Chinese plaintiffs have sort of mobilized and decided that they want to seek uh, use litigation to seek reparations, um, for, for many of them, the Chinese government wouldn't actually issue them a passport or issue them travel, travel uh, approval to go to Japan. So that was another way that they could sort of um, uh, hem and haw or equivocate about how far they wanted to go in recognizing this individual right to compensation. So again, you'll, you'll see statements made by, you know, important people. Jiang Zemin's kind of a big deal. Um, but when it comes to actually um, practicing it or, or, or putting that idea of a claim into practice into a lawsuit, right, a lawsuit in China or a lawsuit in Japan, um, the government has, I think, equivocated at best. So yes, you know, I think the Chinese government itself gave up the right, but they have at least acknowledged that it's, you know, theoretically possible that an individual right to compensation still exists. And if you look at the South Korean decision, that idea of an individual does not appear in the main majority opinion, but there are a couple of, um, uh, a two judge or two justice signed concurring opinion where they talk about the idea of the individual right existing despite the Korean government getting rid of or giving up, I should say, the right to reparation in the 1965 basic treaty. Uh, people have also criticized the joint communique for not actually going through the formal uh, ratification process. So it's a communique, it's not a treaty, it never went through the National People's Congress and so therefore can't actually serve as a legally binding instrument. That's another um, 
another way to get around this, uh, the idea that the PRC waived its, uh, waived its, uh, its rights. Um, so again, another possible attack on that. In terms of, of uh, what, is it, what, is, what does it mean for prospects? Well, again, whether it's the individual victim herself or himself um, or their children. And so what, what's, what's happening is that sure, these people are dying because they're 95 years old, but in, in many, if not most instances, their kids actually keep up the fight, right? That's true in China, that's true in South Korea. Um, and so even if the individual him or herself dies, I think the fact that the, the wound itself or the harm itself has still gone unrecognized and still gone uncompensated um, still matters, right? There, there's still, I think, a need for Japan, and Japan will never do this, but I think, I think from a Korean perspective or a Chinese perspective, there's still a need to address this harm. Um, and, you know, maybe you'll get uh, a judgment that does that, or maybe you'll get a settlement agreement that does that, or maybe you'll get uh, a corporation that will offer its own apology, as has happened in a handful of these settlement agreements. So there are ways to get a modicum of satisfaction. But I think at this point in time, that's sort of the best that any individual Korean or Chinese or Taiwanese plaintiff could hope for at this point. Let me ask one clarif clar uh, clarifying question on what you just said, because I, I, I'm not an international lawyer. Uh, the, ni the, the, the 1951 or 52 treaty, that uh, uh, San Francisco Treaty, I think, uh, did it uh, clearly either deny individual claims or not deal with it? And, and you, you mentioned it very, very quickly there, and I didn't get it. I just... Yeah. Um, so it, it does both. Um, huh. It says that uh, Americans have given up their rights, but each individual country can um, pursue it as he or she wants. And so when American POWs went to Japan to seek reparations for being you know, beaten or starved or mistreated while they were POWs, um, uh, Japanese court said, sorry, you know, your government waived this. Um, but, and, and Japan had to go negotiate with all of these different countries and negotiate with China in the 70s and negotiated with Korea in the 60s. Um, Philippines, and that's the 1965 claim settlement. 1965 claim settlement. I see. That, that's is, is in Korea. the 2018 is the, is the Korean opinion. Um, and so they, they, and they were, moreover, they were able to, um, well, actually the, the, the Japanese did give uh, some small amount of loans and grants to the Koreans in 1965. Um, part of it was supposed to be used to compensate forced laborers and others, uh, but the Korean government, you know, provided a tiny, a tiny amount of um, recompense to certain mem certain forced laborers, but didn't do so in a particularly full manner. Uh, and so that's why you have people coming up even now and uh, and demanding reparations. So the, the revisionism that you discussed in Korea is part of the explanation for the difference between uh, Taiwanese and Korean attitudes towards uh, uh, Japan. Um, is that revisionism, um, how, how is that? Because in my understanding, uh, the Korean government in 1965, at the time of the claims settlement, in all kinds of extra, non in, not in the treaty itself, mm -hmm. basically said all kinds of things, set up all kinds of, of systems that would seem totally inconsistent with the 2018 Korean Supreme Court decision, uh, including, and this is the question, did the Korean government take some of the money that was meant for individual laborers can comfort women and build quote, quote infrastructure to increase the, the general economic welfare of the Korean people, close quote. It's not really a quote, it's a paraphrase. Um, and is, is that true? Did the Korean government in the 60s take some of the compensation meant for the individuals and spend it on railroads? Yes, yes, that is true. Um, but let me, let me clarify. So, and, you know, you have to look at what was discussed by the two parties and the two parties did discuss forced labor, right? And so you could say, well, look, the parties discussed it. 
and uh, this is the you know this is a treaty that they decided to uh, to resolve these issues, um, but they never discussed comfort women, right? And so comfort women, I think, have a have a you know stronger claim in that 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 discussion about how to compensate comfort women never even took place. Um, but but the other point is 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 correct in that. Um, I forget, it's like $200 million in grants and $300 million loan or so, something like that. It's, it's $500 million. And uh, part of it, a very small part of it, I want to say maybe in, in the tens of thousands, went to a select number of forced laborers and others who were, uh, who were harmed by uh, Japanese colonialism. But in the main, and again, this is not a democratically elected government. Um, this is an autocracy. This is a, a, a you know, uh, Sigmund Rhee. Um, so, you know, there, there's no accountability to the people. And if you go back and look at the popular reaction to the basic treaty, I mean, people are swarming the streets in Seoul, um, denouncing it and saying, you know, as the question about China just suggested, that the, their, their government had sold them out to the Japanese. So there was, you know, widespread popular dissatisfaction with the basic treaty in 1965. Um, people did not think that their interests were being well represented by um, by the South Korean government at the time. That raises very interesting questions about sort of the current Korean government's responsibility for the, in hindsight, illegitimate Korean government of the 1960s mm -hmm. uh, that would seem to be an internal Korean question. Um, well, yeah, and, yeah, and to respond to that, the, the Korean government has set up uh, a number of, of truth and reconciliation commissions, as well as a number of laws that provide compensation, not from Japan. I think, I think what sticks with a lot of these plaintiffs is that they want it to come from Japan, right? They under, yeah. Yes, they, under, they, they get the money, right? But the money comes from a piece of legislation passed by the South Korean diet, not diet, but South Korean National Assembly, uh, and doesn't come from the people who harm them. So um, in, in the article that uh, you attached to this talk, I talk about people wanting an apology, people wanting an admission of liability, and sometimes those are more important forms of satisfaction than the check. And I think this example we're talking about right now, the South Koreans, yeah, you know, they'll get a couple of thousand bucks from this law or from that law, or, you know, comfort women have also have access to uh, funds made available by the South Korean government. But what they want, or what many of them want, is um, an apology, right, that what we did to you was legally, morally, ethically wrong. Um, and we want you to admit it. We want you to say what I did was wrong. And so those, those two things, the, the apology and the acknowledgement of liability, often seem to be more important with Chinese and I think with Koreans um, than the, the paycheck or the, the small and the, compensation. Is it also true that there is now or uh, a a movement in Japan or uh, to pay money to the comfort women that was initiated by the Japanese government but is not formally yep. the Japanese government and that therefore the comfort women in Korea many of them some of them have accepted the money but I, this is a question I but my understanding is some of them have accepted the money others have refused the money because although coming from Japan, it comes from Japanese citizens, yep. not from the Japanese government. Exactly. So in the, in the early 1990s, you have a change in government in Japan. You have the LDP falling away for a brief one year, one and a half year respite. And seven minutes, I think it was. <laughs> seven minutes, yes. A very brief period of time in which some of these efforts, you know, the apologies from, from Murayama, um, the, uh, the Kato statement, Kato is still LDP, um, but the Asian Women's Fund is what you're talking about in particular, yes. Frank, and that was an effort um, by uh, the Murayama uh, cabinet to address the issue of comfort women. And you're, and you're right, the Japanese government said, we will pay for the medical expenses, but the, the, the financial compensation piece is going to come from the Japanese people. Right, so if you, Japanese citizen, want to donate your money to the Asian Women's Fund, we will pool those resources together, 
and we will then send them over to Korean or Filipina or Chinese or Taiwanese comfort women who can apply and step forward and, uh, and accept these monies. But um, people look at that and, and see it as a hollow gesture. I mean, literally a hollow gesture where you've essentially opened up your coffers and people can throw their money in as they walk by. That's not compensation from the, from the Japanese government. That's compensation from the people, right? And it wasn't necessarily the people that enslaved the comfort women. It was, you know, usually the military or usually government actors or, uh, as the case often was, um, on the ground Koreans uh, or on the ground Taiwanese who are, who are working with the Japanese to, to mobilize these people in the first place. So, um, and, and you're right, the popular reaction in South Korea was, was very negative. Um, the, the Korean Council, uh, this powerful uh, women's rights NGO, basically, said, basically blackballed any South Korean comfort woman who accepted it and said, um, we'll get the government to pass its own legislation that will and give you some amount of compensation. So don't accept that. That's, that's you know, bad money or dirty money. Um, uh, but there are at least 200, 200 plus um, Filipino women who actually did accept it, right? So in, 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 Phil in the Philippines, it wasn't quite as politicized to the extent it was in South Korea. Um, so there, there have been efforts in Japan. And then uh, in 2015, there was another agreement that the Japanese and South Korean government worked out to address this issue. Um, where the Japanese would put in around $9 million, again, to cover medical expenses. Um, and that uh, agreement fell apart very quickly as well once it was revealed that neither side, right, neither the South Korean government or the Japanese government actually bothered talking to the comfort women themselves to ask what they wanted. It all took place sub rosa. You know, people were surprised because no one had ever, no one expected it. Uh, the Obama administration had put, had put pressure on both governments um, to do so, there's a, a Korean constitutional court decision that says, Korean government, go renegotiate this. But, you know, when that agreement was announced on December 28th, 2015, most people were, were quite surprised by it. And uh, one of the reasons they were able to keep their secrecy is because they never actually talked to the women who were most affected by it. Um, so that's supposed to be the, the final, uh, the final uh, conclusion to the saga. Um, it didn't actually last the end of Park Geun-hye's administration and such that by the time Moon Jae-in stepped in, uh, he essentially um, uh, abdicated that, uh, or renounced, I suppose I should say, renounced that agreement. Well, we have uh, uh, several more questions, more than we will have time to deal with, but um, I will take them in chronological order. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to read here. Uh, Professor Webster, you focused on litigation, both in Japan's courts and in the case of the Korean Supreme Court decision. The plaintiff's decision to turn next to their own nation's courts. In the West, the exhaustion of remedies in the injuring state's courts was followed or sometimes supplanted by international espousal through state to state negotiations, claim commissions, etc., resulting in lump sum payments. East Asian states certainly have some experience with this as the receiving state. For example, when Canada and others pursued sex majors with China in the 70s and 80s. When they pursued what? Uh, such measures. Uh, oh, measures, okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm sorry. Has espousal not been a part of the inter-East Asian reparation story? And I think that the question means intra, not inter, but mm -hmm. um, if not, why do you think these states have not pursued it? If it, if it has been pursued and given the tight rules on nationality and international espousal, has the Japanese colonial policy of treating those it colonized as Japanese subjects been a major complicating factor? <laughs> um, so yeah, Frank, I didn't yes, mean to be, uh, I, could I actually hear all the questions just so I can write them down and think about them and then? I, I think I, 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 by the time I read all the questions, we will come to an end. Okay, okay. Um, um, but I, I'll, I'll read a, a, a simpler question, uh, <laughs> or at least, a, at least a shorter one. Yeah. <laughs> there is a sense among some ordinary Japanese that Japan has never fully acknowledged any wrongful conduct. There are also periodic complaints in China about Japanese leaders' visit to the Yasukuni Shrine. Yep. In fact, Hasn't Japan taken some steps to compensate China and Chinese for World War II conduct? Can you please clarify the facts? Yeah. 
I'm not aware of any. Um, oh, I mean, okay. I, I mentioned the settlement agreement that Mitsubishi worked out with Chinese forced laborers. There have been a couple of other settlements that uh, Japanese companies have worked out with both Korean forced laborers and Chinese forced laborers. Um, and of course, as we said, the PRC waived its rights to seek reparations in the 1972 joint communique. Um, but maybe that person could could suggest if there's a certain reparations payment he or she has in mind, because I'm I'm not aware of any. Not to say it doesn't exist, but I just I'm not entirely sure what what he or she is referring to. Um, I'll take a stab at the first question, um, which is you know my my understanding is that uh, the governments have not. So again, you know the, the South Korean government clearly did negotiate with the Japanese on this 2015 Comfort Women Agreement. Um, but, you know, might not have done so in, in the best of faith. I'm not want to suggest they didn't do it in good faith, but um, didn't uh, consult people, right? And I think uh, at this point in time, consultation is sort of the bare minimum thing you have to do when you're trying to redress grievances from people who are alive. Um, so I, I think, you know, the South Koreans have, have, have played some role. Um, but again, I, I don't, th and I think this is probably more true of the Chinese than the South Koreans, I don't see anything to suggest that the Chinese government has gone and negotiated in, in good faith with the Japanese. Now, again, it may have happened and there's no um, public documents that I have access to that suggest that those, those negotiations took place. Um, but, you know, my sense is that the Chinese government just hasn't, uh, you know, and, and the reasons might have changed, right? They might have said no in the 19, early 1990s because they were so keen to get Japanese investment and Japanese technology and Japanese know-how and Japanese expertise. Um, uh, whereas now, and, and again, you, know, you, you can play the Japan card in China to some extent, right? We've seen that some of the largest protests that have taken place in China mm -hmm. over the past yeah. 30 years have been directed at the Japanese. So I don't wanna say that the government has done nothing, but as far as I understand, I haven't seen anything to suggest that uh, top level Chinese officials have have had similar or have negotiations with similarly situated Japanese officials to address this problem. And I, th I get the sense that's also the way it's also the case with the Korean government, again, with this exception of the comfort women, uh, comfort women agreement from from 2015, but nothing about um, uh, nothing about forced laborers, for example. Uh, I think since it's one 29, the chances of me even reading the first sentence of the next question uh, are very slight. So, um, and, and uh, I think, I hope that we can find a way to get these questions that they will exist after the Zoom is meeting is over, uh, or people can just write you directly. Uh, Tim, I just want to thank you. Um, fascinating. Fascinating and important, and of course, I, well, no, I will. I, I have another question, but I'm not. I will. I, I too can contact you after. Yes, you can. After. You can. So, yeah, uh, if, if you have you questions much. that didn't get answered or didn't even, didn't even get asked, I would yeah. uh, love to hear from you. Well, there are only uh, a couple questions that didn't get asked, but um, okay. Yeah. But I All will. Right. Thanks very much, Tim. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Frank okay. and Catherine and, and Alexis, and thanks you all for uh, for joining me today. Appreciate it.